So good afternoon, everyone, and once again, welcome to our special uh, Prop Funders Community Webinar, is what we call it. And you can see on the screen there, the special topic today is Property Mentorship Unplugged, or the good and the bad and the ugly, which we'll come on to in a few moments. Uh, so my name is David Johnson. I'm the CVO of Prop Funders, and you'll hear a little bit about what we do at the very end. But these are all about free learning, free education, and uh, today we are going to have an absolute treat. So I'm absolutely delighted, delighted, delighted for the uh, uh, the itinerary today. So first of all, let me officially welcome um, our two sort of special guests, um, Ruth Hunter. Hi, Ruth, how are you? I'm good, thank you. So uh, anyone who's joined since I popped on, so yeah, apologies about my ambient sounds outside. Uh, but yes, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a, it's a subject actually... After we met the other week, you know that um, I'm I'm quite interested in right now. Quite, uh, I've got a fair amount of ex uh, experience on the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that. Yeah, it's, it's going to be really, really good. And uh, Angus Griffin, how are you today, my friend? I'm very well, David. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to to having a chat with yourself and Ruth. You know, kind of and 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 working at how we can we can give some valuable advice to people thinking about you know getting into this murky mixed world that that's a really good actually description murky mixed i like i like that so uh you'll both have an opportunity to uh formally introduce yourselves in a minute when we come on to, to that segment with a couple of wee um items first before we move into the the special topic so let me just quickly jump on i, I sometimes like to remind people what prop funders is about um this is the old sort of military background that for sort of dies hard with me and that is when you're out on a mission, you're out on an op, you've always got to remember like what is the goal, what is the mission, what are we about, what, what have we got to achieve. Um, and with prop funders, um, what we get out of bed for in the morning, what we're trying to, the value we're trying to bring to the market is to empower SME property developers to build more homes by disrupting the alternative funding market. That that's what we're about, uh, and that if you like is the overarching theme of our monthly community webinars that's the thread if you like that runs through them all so so that's what we're about trying to work with sme property developers and landlords uh, to help them build more homes much needed of course um in the current climate so um quick rundown of what we'll cover today in about 50 minutes um our main topic property mentorship unplugged the good the bad and the ugly um we've also got a uh, contribution from uh, Todd Walker from Villator Media, uh, who jumps on from time to time, and Todd um, works with prop funders um, through his Villator Media brand, and um, he's of all the guys I know in, in this industry in this space, he's passionate about learning, but he's also passionate about educating um, and and giving people tips. So he's going to do a short section on short form videos and content, which will be brilliant. Um, we'll do a short market roundup as we always do. Uh, and then we'll talk about the next the next webinar. Um, one thing I'll say first of all, this is more more for uh, uh, for um, Angus and Ruth. So um, sometimes the business owner gets overruled by their team, um, and this certainly happened for today because I had this idea of the good and bad and the ugly, and we've all can remember the classic of Clint Eastwood: the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then it was sort of pointed out to me by the by the by the team. Well, good, bad, and ugly. So if, if Ruth's the good one, that then leaves Angus and me fighting over the bad and the ugly. So I think, Angus, rather than you and me fighting over that, we just decided to, to knock that on the head as a promo. And, uh, yeah, we better move swiftly on. I'm being called worse, so, you know, no skin <laughs> off my face. <laughs> right. you've got a picture <laughs> <laughs> what was that <laughs> so uh, that's that's where we are so listen let's get on with it here quick market update and i'll I'll, uh, I'll allow um each of you to say a quick sort of one sentence summary on any thoughts but i suppose the big news in terms of the property market is of course new labor government um they're certainly urging the bank of england to drop base rate um of course they would any new government would um mortgages number of large banks have recently decreased their mortgage rates. Um, Labour are talking about Britain building again, and obviously this endless discussion about reform of planning, um, and currently inflation holding steady around the target 2%. So they're really the, the main market updates. Um, 
any of the three of you want to just comment on that or any any thoughts on 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 the new government and what might happen over the next couple of uh, couple of years um well it, it's a, it's definitely an interesting time um i was listening to the nrla podcast this week um the listen up landlords so if anyone wants to keep up to speed on things then i really highly recommend the nrla's podcast it's brilliant um but it was really interesting the discussions that they had regarding you know obviously the abolishing of section 21 and you know all of these things everything so we're kind of in this limbo period um and there's a lot of really interesting discussion over that for example um you know it's all just basically the, the abolishing of section 21 was very much a marketing ploy for manifesto but actually in the reality of it you know there was a reason why conservatives couldn't push this through it's because obviously our courts aren't ready for it um, and actually only 80 percent of landlords uh, of agents over the last i can't remember how many years have ever issued a section 21 so it, it's it's one of those things where it's kind of buzzwords but actually in the reality of it is it really going to affect us probably not but i am very excited regarding the pr prospects with regards to actually the easing of uh, restrictions regarding planning you know, yeah. I think that is going to benefit small developers as well. I think they're going to have to focus on them because one of my big things is I don't think the top 10 house builders have the appetite, as they said on the podcast, to mm -hmm. actually produce the 1.5 million homes. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. who's that going to fall down to? The smaller and middle class sized um, developers. So, yeah, I think it's a really exciting time, actually. I was a bit hesitant, but I'm starting to come more on board with it. Mm. Yeah, and you make a good point about the the SME developers, which again is one of the reasons why we we have went this route um, with a with our business model. And if you, obviously if you go back, you know, to two thousand and eight last credit crunch, and you know something like 40 of houses in the UK were built. Well, England were built by SME developers, and that's down to about ten percent currently. So that's where we need to get building again, um, and that's why it's such an exciting market that SME developer. Because as you say, Ruth, the big guys aren't gonna aren't gonna do it. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, okay, Angus, any takeaways from that? Yeah, I, look, I totally agree with what Ruth has said. I think for me, you know, there are opportunities there. There are areas of concern, but at this stage, um, the devil's always in the detail. So mm -hmm. you can't really assess the impact on you as a landlord or on you as a developer mm -hmm. until you see the detail. Like, you know, kind of if they're going to reform planning, then great. But you know operationally how is that going to work in practice and when are we going to start seeing the benefits of that it's the same with you know kind of the abolition of section 21 most people i think ruth said exactly right most people use 21 because um it's it's easier than eight so you know is that a big loss not particularly is it the right thing to do probably but it all depends on whether actually that can be operationalized through an effective court system so i think it's it's a it's a wait and see mantra for me yeah, no, that's probably a good one. Wait and see. Todd, any any takeaways of that before we head over to you? No, just waiting to see what happens, basically. <laughs> yeah. um, and and we'll react accordingly. Yeah, probably the wisest the the wisest uh, wait, wait and see. Okay, so Todd, I will hand you over the uh, the controls now, and for for a short session on um, really social media presence and this uh, sort of concept of of short short content. Um, and obviously, you're someone who is passionate about this. You're out and about with developers, a whole range of clients and, and visiting properties up and down the country. Um, so I think you're very well placed to, to cover this. So let me uh, stop share, I think. And there you go. You should be able to do what you have to do. I think my computer doesn't like when I switch between this. So apologies, the camera is going to be off for this. Um, can you see the screen? Yes, absolutely. Fab, fab. So yeah, as David mentioned, I, I work with a lot of property developers and helping them create short form content. It's a really big, important part of top of funnel marketing for your business, for investors and developers, especially for bringing in new investment or even just looking for deals. This is a great way that people can see that you're actively looking for deals or you're actively looking for investment. And then you can show them and show these people that are interested in your stuff via, you know, the projects you're doing and then displaying it in, in short form content. So what is short form content? Short form content refers to concise, easy, digestible piece of information or media, and it's designed to be quickly consumed. So a lot of you guys probably have been on Facebook and seen Facebook Reels, TikTok, Instagram, 
those kind of reels, those short videos, YouTube, they put their short side. There's, there's a lot of different things, but also that extends down to sort of blog posts, infographics, memes, GIFs, emails, and newsletters. So more sort of traditional ways. It's not just video content, but I specifically focus on video content uh, because it's just, I've always made videos and that's how, how, how it is. And how do we use it? So as I mentioned before, videos and this short form style is specifically good at just getting awareness it's it's amazing at how many people you can reach we've had videos that have reached over 1.6 million people just over a 30 second clip and that brings in an awful lot of traffic to different areas and then with other systems in your business then you can plug that into funnels and different sort of ways of then converting those people into either clients investors or acquiring sort of what you'd like out of this so you know you're using this to define your brand addressing your target audience you have a consistent message and you can obviously use this to show your case studies different things that you're doing and the main thing is is just it's quick and easy to get out so you will always have that sort of brand consistency and that awareness constantly there obviously the different types of people that can use anyone can do this but obviously i've just named nine here but all these different types of developers investors or property people can can be doing this and basically just getting stuff out there because you post something out there two three hundred people are going to see it every time if you're posting that every single day for 30 days it starts to add up very quickly and the best type of short form content i'm going to probably bias but videos videos on social media receive 130 five percent more organic reach than photos so if you immediately want to double the people that you're reaching just change to a video and you're you're, you're already there and obviously that you know here's a few more facts but they retain a bit more information and consumers want to see video content from brands because it gives them a little bit more of a personal touch and then emails as well help with click-through rates and stuff like that so if you're trying to get people into webinars or you're trying to you know it's show people a new product and you've got a a discount on or something it's a great way of, of getting through that um i'm running through this very quickly because i don't want to take up too much time but i do have a couple of examples here which i'm just going to switch i've just shared the wrong i don't share the screen and not i have shared the screen so you should now be able to see this when this comes up I'm going to stop it there. Granted, yeah. there's a, you know, <laughs> it's, it's hard because we don't have trending audio on these ones. Cause we do that when we post that on, on the platforms, but that was a guy obviously speaking as Martin, he, he was talking about courses and stuff that he's done. So we've broken down his course videos that he's previously filmed, put them into a short form video that he can then go and post out online. And he might average between, you know, 700 and a thousand views per short video. Whereas his long form video might've only achieved a few hundred views. And then you can then funnel people in same thing with uh, Ben from XP property. Yeah. And there's no sound on that Todd. You know that? Yeah. I don't know that because obviously the sound, was... the sound's not coming through just so you know. Okay. So I don't know how to, <laughs> Uh, to do that did you not enable that on the settings yeah but you've taken control so you'd have to do it on your side right but the sounds down at the bottom you see when you're sharing screen when you go to share screen there'll be an option for Is that coming through now video no so but they, they can get the idea anyway from the from the yeah. uh well, what, what you could do if you have any links buy the links into the chat um when you finish and then they can We'll yeah, okay. links or even the there. social media I mean, links. It doesn't give me any options to select sound. That's yeah. weird. Okay, anyway, but you get the point. There's there's a few different bits and bobs. Um and yeah, I I didn't mean to stop sharing. There we go. That's fine. But yeah, so we've got examples and then questions. So essentially a lot of people like film content, we do property tours, we do events, we do obviously breaking down of webinars different types of content that's being filmed and then ready for clients to post on on their social media so that's a very 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 quick overview of short form content and i apologize for the uh no sound sound no it happens sometimes uh, things we can't think about no that's that's really interesting i think 
I think it's it's a for the older generation like myself, Todd, and I've had this conversation. Um, different for for Ruth and Angus, of course, they're they're so young, but uh, the idea of like putting the camera to your face all the time and and recording yourself and 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 even then the consistency of it, I think that's I found the hardest, but that's where success lies is being yourself, getting yourself out there. Um, any any ways of getting around that that sort of uh, fear. Any ways of getting around the fear of it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. Say like, like the thing is, it's like you're going to be scared if you ride a motorbike for the first time. Or you're going to you just do it. The more you, if you ride it a hundred times, you're not going to be scared the hundred time. If you make a hundred videos, you're not going to be scared the hundred time. And I'd say just film it, post it, look at it, review it, film, post, and just sort of if you have that little schedule, then then you always do it. Never hold back from what you've done. If you film something, you've done it to the best that you can at this very moment in time, then it is the best it will ever be at this moment in time. So then you yeah. you film it, you post it and it's out there. And then you'll watch it back and you'll be like, oh, that was horrendously cringe. I'm not going to do that in the next one. And then you do that a hundred times. Like you, by the time you get to a hundred, you're going to know what you don't like, what, you, what you're what what you good at and then how you can say it in a way that engages people and that people are, you know, or, or you don't look at it and think, oh, this is horrendous. So yeah. Yeah, okay. So it sounds good. No, absolutely like that. Fantastic. Thank you. Right. Okay. Well, listen, I appreciate that, Todd. I know you have a busy day today, so you can you can feel yeah, free to um, hang out or, or drop off whatever you want. It's entirely yeah. up to yourself. Thanks for having right. us. I appreciate that. And good luck. And I'll, I'll obviously watch this back anyway. So <laughs> yeah, fantastic. See that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Todd. Appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Let's get back to where we were, if we can. Brilliant. So thank you, Todd, for that. Um, some great sort of tips and, and, and quick takeaways for everybody. So let's get in now to our big topic for today. So, so, so looking forward to this today. Um, brilliant topic. So we'll go Angus first, actually. Angus, just take a minute, introduce yourself, background, and of course, what you're sort of doing now in the space. Okay. Well, so my name's Angus Griffin. Uh, my background was uh, I was a financial services lawyer uh, in London working for a magic circle firm and then the Financial Conduct Authority for about 15 years. Um, alongside that, I started investing in property in 2005. Uh, yeah, I was pretty clueless when I started, I'll admit to that. But over time, built it up, learned a lot, spent money on education, continue to. Um, and over the past 20 years, we've built up a relatively large portfolio across the country, predominantly with a focus on the Northeast. Um, uh, I started mentoring both privately and for kind of property training companies probably about eight years ago. I now just focus on on the private side of it. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm kind of uh, that's what we do on a day to day basis. We have a regulated sourcing company operating out the northeast. Um, so that's me. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you. And our second panelist today for our discussion, uh, Ruth Hunter. Ruth, over to you. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. So I own Veritas Property. I'm a property developer based down in Gloucestershire in the Cotswolds. And I'm actually, relative, I still say I'm relatively new. So I actually properly started my um, property journey back in 2020 with education. And then basically I have a wedding and event design company, which due to COVID obviously closed pretty imminently uh, for, for a short period. Uh, but we were forced to then sell our property, our own home, and we invested that money then into a property to give us a bit more security. But I also used the training and the knowledge and the skills that I got from my training to then acquire a small portfolio in the space of six months of three HMOs with a GDB of over 1.1 million. And then we've continued to grow that using creative strategies like purchase lease options, et cetera. But I specialize now in supported living and I'm a huge advocate for accessible housing. And I'm now an international speaker, shall I say, um, basically speaking to uh, developers and investors with the importance of how we should all be providing more accessible properties. So that's my quick sort of journey into property. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I've known Angus you for probably about goodness, it must be five years now, Angus. I guess since maybe I first um, met you. Um, yeah. Remember, you actually spoke. I think the first time I heard you speak live was at, at uh, our mutual friend John Corey's Property Fortress event um, one night in London. Um, that must be oh, it's got to be five years ago, is it? Yeah, maybe Long a bit. Time? Yeah, maybe a bit more. Yeah, okay, very, very good. So that was really, really good to sort of meet you. And obviously, we've done we we bits and pieces um sort of since then. You're kind of the the 
one of the go-to people when, when the FCA announced something new. It's like given your background and obviously the ex-enforcement officer, et cetera, you're always well on the up to date with what's happening in that sort of regular space. So thank you for all your uh, your, your tips and help in the, in the past on that. Um, Ruth, I met you for the first time just a couple of weeks ago, uh, as you mentioned in Belfast. And and uh, I guess I said afterwards at that event um, before it closed that it's probably one of the best um, presentations I've heard. And I've heard a lot over the years. But uh, I thought you were excellent how you presented that night and really got your message about um, you know accessible housing. You got across really well. So um, thank glad you. To have both, glad to have both of you on. So right. So this is going to go on the screen. Then we're going to take it off the screen. So um, obviously uh, we have people on now live on the broadcast. But our main reason for doing these is to get the recording, uh, and then we do shorts out of this, and we divide the content up, and we use it for for for, for weeks um, after the actual event. Um, so um, there's sort of the, the the five ways we're going to sort of steer the conversation. Um, I'm going to come off screen now, so we're all going to be just on, on screen on our own. Um, at the bottom there, if you do want to grab, there's a blog um, that we have done um, on the, the five essential um, tips for property mentoring success. So uh, you're feel free to grab that. Um, always glad to have comments from people. So please leave any comments or questions for Ruth or for Angus in the Q&A box. Don't put it in the chat box, stick it in the Q&A. Um, and then we'll we'll uh, deal with it at the relevant time, um, depending on how the time goes on on the the webinar. So um, as I come off this, I suppose to start off, um, and I must also say we're we're not going to mention any particular companies, either I think good, bad, or ugly. Today is probably the best thing, um, unless maybe if I don't know if you're obviously involved in a company, which is fine. And Angus, you've been involved in companies, so any of those companies, but those that we have no kind of personal um involvement with i think we better just not mention the names i think my big fear today is that uh depending on the conversation <laughs> goes, and we all and we all be honest then there's going to be i'll be calling you angus as a, a lawyer saying i've got a, a libel suit against me because we we mentioned such and such a company <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, no de no defamation cases please yeah, <laughs> please, please not so uh um i suppose the, the, the we'll go with the title first of all good the bad the ugly um uh, angus we'll go with you first then as you alluded to uh it's a mixed bag out there. Some great companies and been perfectly blunt, some really shabby cowboy companies. So how, how would you assess the market with the range of companies out there that do mentorship and, and training? I think it's difficult. I think, you know, from, from my perspective, there's there's a big difference between a really good sales and marketing company and, and you know, a lot of property education companies, that's what they are. They're sales and marketing companies. They're selling a product. And actually, someone who can provide you with really good property education in terms of what you in particular need. So just having, like like Todd might be able to provide you, just having really good social media, just be able to, you know, having really good adverts, you know, kind of presenting, a, a you know, a, a glossy picture of what life is like as a property investor says nothing really about the quality of your training education and support so i think and you know that's very hard to differentiate you know when you're a customer going in um and and really stepping back and being able to think about that you know and i think it's and obviously at these events you know a lot of these events there's a time pressure there's 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 you know that that formal feeling so it doesn't really afford you the space to step back and think okay well let me actually you, you know, kind of look at this company, look at the reviews, speak to people who've been through it, you, you know, kind of have a look at maybe what this company is actually doing mm -hmm. um, to assess actually, um, you know, what is really good sales and marketing uh, and what is actual experience and the ability then, more importantly, to, to communicate and translate that experience so that you as a customer can understand it. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. No, that's a really good, a really good sort of starter for 10. So, Ruth, in terms of similar just your view of the market and what you have experienced in, in your journey? Um, so I actually started my property journey. We all hate that word, don't we? But my property journey, I, I took the decision all the way back in 2014 where I was thinking, okay, what can I do to eventually get out of the wedding industry? You know, I, it was a, it's um, a really high pace industry and I thought I need something which is more passive. So, and, you know, I did the standard stumble across, you know, rich dad, poor dad, all of those sorts of things, absorbed as much free information as I could. 
and went straight into buying a, a flip at auction in 2017 with no education, no knowledge, no support. Like it was literally baptism by fire, learn on the job. And, you know, the amount of money that I made was zero. Uh, the, the lessons I learned were huge, but actually I then, and it scared me. Um, I, I actually, you know, I thought, God, this is actually really bloody hard. And so I, it took me a few years then to come back to it and go, no, actually, I really do want to do property, mm. but I need help. I need knowledge. I need education. Otherwise, this is going to be a very long, painful process. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, and um, uh, I discovered uh, Mr. Zucci. And I thought, you know, this was a entry level home study course course. Um, which was it was affordable for me at the time and I have to say that that I've gone through and I'm now a pin host and you know I've gone through that process so that's one company but I would say that is education rather than the mentoring mm. and over the course of the time as I have signed up with multiple different people mo multiple mentors um, I've had different training and I think understanding as Angus said the difference between somebody who has got the evidence behind them to show that they've been there they've done it they've got the war wounds they you know i would say i will now only go with someone who can prove that they've lost money basically um there are a lot of people out there who are still you know it, it would be the equivalent of me only a few years in going right i'm going to be a trainer i'm going to be a mentor and there are a lot of people out there doing it who have only got a few years experience under their belt um, but they've got brilliant marketing and they have brilliant social media. And, you know, it's very easy to get sucked into the story that, the, you know, the the smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I and I've experienced from both sides. I've, I've gone for the smoke and mirrors. I've been sucked in by people from that level of, you know, quite minimal experience right through to actually being trained by some of the leaders within property education. So, um, but I think it's it's it is very easy for people to be advertised to to get the quick sale, the quick win, earn money quickly. You know that's what we want to do, and it's too easy. It's not regulated, and I think yeah. that's one of the big problems. No, that's a really good point, and you you said something earlier which I think leads on to the sort of the first point on our our five points, if you like, to take us through this this topic, and that is the setting of objectives at the start. Uh, and you made a really good point, which I think is often missed, and that is there's a massive difference between training and education, if you like, and mentoring. And Absolutely. And, and, I, and I liken it to, to swimming. You know, you could run a course on swimming on YouTube and all the different ways to swim and how to enter the water and what stroke to use. I mean, it's so minimal value to learn to swim unless you jump into the pool or jump into the sea. And, and and therefore the, the mentor that jumps into the water with you and helps you how to stroke and you know stay afloat and all those things is totally different than someone doing a you know a book or or, or just a a theory so so I think that that is that is really really interesting when you say that but how, I suppose the question is how, the onus really I suppose is on the buyer to decide what do I want is it just education to learn or do I want that person who's been in the trenches before? To hold my hand is that a fair uh, i mean maybe we sometimes do the companies at the service because it's up really to the buyer to know what they want first and foremost is that fair um i think it is i think it is i think it's difficult as well because you know kind of i'm not a salesman right so if anyone comes and talks to me about mentoring i don't sell them anything and i, I tell them i won't sell them anything but some people actually feel like they want to be sold to and i will lose you know, quite happily, mm -hmm. someone who, who who wants to be sold to, because that's not my thing. I won't sell you the dream. I'll tell you what it'll take. And um, and we'll have a realistic discussion about it. And and those people tend to get attracted to the jazzy Lamborghini Towton, you know, kind of individuals who you may or may not see around. Um, ultimately, though, a lot of them, it, it, you know, kind of, it, it, you, you know, they don't get what they need and it, and it comes back. Um, I think, you know, for me, it, in a way, there's, and it's like what we said, the most important point to start with is, yes, it is up to the buyer, but the buyer has to go into something like this, clear on what they want. And I think that's difficult when you're going into a train and where people are throwing strategies at you. And it's really hard within that hour or days, you know, of that train and to work out what's right for you. You know, kind of it's very hard to do that at that stage. I think, you know, you might need some assistance thinking, well, what do I want property to do for me? 
in what time scale, you know, kind of, um, and then working back from there in terms of, you know, kind of which strategies are open to me to be able to do that. So I think it is up to the buyer, but I think sometimes unwittingly what the buyer doesn't know is that maybe they just need some help up front working out um, mm -hmm. whether what they think they want actually fits with uh, what they do. So, you know, for me personally, I will spend probably an hour or two when they're in a the client as part of the take-on process, just talking to them about actually what they think they want and whether that's workable and whether I think I can work with them. Because I would say kind of 50% of the time after that conversation, what they think, what they come out with is actually slightly different from what they came in with. Yeah. 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 No, that, that's fair. Um, and and uh, Ruth, in terms of just comment on this setting to your objectives is is if you're working with clients is that something you would do as well is really work out what, what it is um that 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 you need and what they want out of it i what are their objectives and is that harder when it's a group scenario rather than working one-on-one -on -one? um um, so obviously I'm coming it from the project, from the, from the aspects of the, the mentee and, you know, so, cause I'm not, I'm not a mentor. And so having gone into multiple different training courses and mentorships, you know, the first thing that everybody talks about is your why. Hmm. Okay. So, and we all know that we have to know what the why is. And I would say pretty consistently, whether you're a coach or a mentor or an educator, that's always been the very first question. So I would say that that's fairly consistent. I think then understanding then, you know, for an education program to then really get into the nitty gritty and sort of help guide you into the right direction is very difficult because it's a very generalized, you know, subject matter a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Certainly when you're looking at the bigger training companies, they try to cram everything into short spaces of time. I would say the when I've worked with a mentor, though, and this is the difference, people have to understand the difference between a coach and a mentor. And I think a lot of the time people get very confused or don't understand the difference. So then they can get very disappointed where they're expecting one or the other and they're not receiving that assistance or that help. So I think what you're saying is it's really clear to and it's, it's very important for the buyer to understand really from the first point, what is it do you, you know, what do you want? Do you want someone to hold your hand and really go, okay, right, this is how we do it. This is your objectives. Come back to me next week with and show me what you've done, this, this, then this. Or a coach will very much kind of just sort of not necessarily get in the water with you, so to speak. They'll yeah. just kind of teach you the the basics and the strategies. So I think from an objective point of view, you need to understand, do you just need to know a little bit about property and the, you know, the the different uh, strategies that are out there? Or do you really want someone to push you and, and take you on that journey? Mm -hmm. So there's that objective. Um, and I think what also needs to be really key because I did start with a mentor right at the beginning I did sign up with somebody and she was brilliant I wasn't ready and mm. I think there also has to be that discussion with yourself are you coachable are you able to be a mentee do you have the time and the dedication to actually commit to it because if you don't, then maybe education is better for you because you can just commit to a few hours each week, maybe online with the coach guiding you through the process. With a mentor, I would say you are a lot more accountable and you have to do a lot more work. And I think it's understanding, you know, are you in a position to do either of those things is also another thing that you need to be very clear on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just to stay with you then, just to lead into the next point about relationship. So you made a good point there about the, the Good, good coach mentor, but you weren't quite ready. So, um, and how valuable is that relationship between the, the mentor and the mentee? Um, I mean, obviously there can be a degree of success without it, but is there an exponential value if there is a good relationship between both parties? Oh, I think from, you know, first you've got to respect your coach and mentor, whichever direction you're going in um, and vice versa. They also mm -hmm. have to respect you. Now, I was actually a mentor. I So obviously my background is wedding and events and I was a mentor for a year with the wedding planner school. I shouldn't be a mentor. I just, I don't tolerate fools gladly. I find it very difficult when I get asked really quite simple and stupid questions, what I would thought would be quite stupid questions and things like that. So I think, um, you know, 
did I give them the best mentorship? Probably not, to be perfectly honest with you. And I think there has to be that respect and understanding from the mentor and vice versa. So I would say from a relationship point of view, you know, do you get that sense of respect from the person that you're, you know, when you're doing your due diligence and your, those interviews and finding out about people, I think you need to feel that they respect you and respect what you're trying to achieve. So I think that's really important. Um, and you've got to like them. You know, like you've really got to like, I love some of my mentors, you know, we have a giggle. I really look forward to those coaching calls. And I think if you're working with someone where you kind of go, oh, I've got to spend an hour online with that person or, or what have you, or in the room with them, then they're not the right person for you. So you've got a vibe, you've got to be on the, you know, you've got to have a laugh, you've got to get on with each other. So yeah, relationship is key because otherwise, why are you motivated to do the work if the person on the other side of things I've got a beautiful little doggy, right? He's just come up next to me. Um, <laughs> see, I'm a dog. I'm a dog mum, so I'm very distracted right now. See, <laughs> um, very good. Yeah. So, but yeah, basically, yeah, relationship is key. Yeah, no, no, fantastic. And then Angus, coming at from the slightly different angle, you're the uh, the the mentor. You've obviously very experienced dealing with lots of people. Um, have you ever had a situation where the relationship just just wasn't there? Um, and and how do you how do you then deal with that or how much time do you put into actually building the relationship? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question. I, I, you know, I've, I think the way that I operate is that's why I think I invest so much time up front, whereas others might not in terms of really talking to the person for an hour or two hours. And they're getting a sense of you and they're having the opportunity to grill you as they should do. But you're also trying to get a sense of whether I can work with this person, whether I can add value for this person, whether I'm the right person. I mean, there's certain strategies. Um, if that person says I'm interested in this strategy, there's certain strategy. I don't do rent to rent. I don't do ground up development. I'm not right for that person off path. Mm -hmm. you know, no mm -hmm. mentor does everything. Um, but you're also getting a sense of, OK, what's this person like? You know, you know like who says, what's their vibe? Can I work with them? Can I have fun with them? Because you've got to have fun. Otherwise, it's going to be a struggle. Um do I think that they are the type of person who will put in the work required? Because it is a lot of work. Um, you know, have I always got that right on a gut feel? Not always. I mean, um, you, you can't always do that. And, and when I've worked for training companies in the past, um, you don't have as much say in that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, kind of in those situations, I think it's about um, it's about trying to recognize that as early as possible you know, and, and just be honest with them and, and identify the fact that maybe you aren't, you know, the right, the right fit for that person. And they will get more out of um, a relationship with someone else, you know, by going elsewhere. And I, I like to be honest about that. If something's not working, I don't, I don't try and try and flog a dead horse because it also probably means that I'm having a rubbish time and I'm doing exactly what Ruth said. And I'm going, oh God, here we go again. And that's not where you should be. Yeah. Okay. No, very, very honest. Very good. Okay. So there, there's a stone that I definitely want to turn over, um, which before I forget, um, uh, and that is actually what's it's along with one of the five that we flashed on the screen, but, um, this is property. This is property investment, nothing guaranteed, uh, particularly if it's equity investment, you know, capital is at risk. So everyone gets into mentorship or mentees and no matter how often you tell them, no matter if they've maybe invested in the property and all the risk warnings are from top to bottom, a project goes wrong. So then probably the first phone call they make is to the, is to the mentor. Um, how, how have you found or any examples of that without mentioning obviously personal names, but when they ring up and say, Hey, I've paid you as a mentor, this has all gone horribly wrong. I've lost this amount of money. You know, you, you're, you're either you're partly responsible for this or, or how can you help me out of this mess? How, how, how do you deal with that as a mentor? Um, I think it's a very good question because that does happen. There are always unforeseen circumstances. I think as a mentor, I think you don't get to that point because um, in terms of them ringing you up then, because you see, if you're doing your job, properly, you see that coming a mile off. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, part, I completely agree with Ruth. If you are a mentor, it's not necessarily so much about how much you've done right. Okay. It's about how many times things have gone wrong for you. Um, and that's really important because one of the real values of having a mentor or, or a coach is someone who's actually had that or something similar happen to them. 
so they can kind of help navigate you through that situation. I think, you know, a lot of this is about talking up front about identifying the risks within a particular deal, identifying what steps we are taking to mitigate those risks, but also acknowledging with any property investment, you can't eliminate those risks. So um, I think everyone should go into it. And, and that doesn't sell courses, that approach. That doesn't, you know, work well talking about that when in front of your Lamborghini. Um, but, you know, it's it's the honest truth. So I think, you know, kind of everyone should go in with their eyes open. Um, things do go wrong. And then I think that's where the mentor value really is earned in terms mm -hmm. of, okay, mm -hmm. something's gone wrong. How are we going to deal with it? Um, what yeah. steps do we need to undertake now? And, and having someone just walk them through it and understand the potential implications of it. And that might be that a deal breaks even or a deal doesn't make money because of what's happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's also about reflecting back and making sure that with the planning up front, we've done everything we could to mitigate that risk, but we can't eliminate it. Yeah. Okay. No, good, good answer. Ruth, then from your point of view as a, as a mentee, I think we did touch on this when we we're talking in, in Belfast and that was, you know, where something does go wrong or you see something going wrong and it's like, especially if you're new to the industry and I know you had talked about that, but you sort of jumped in and you didn't have a huge background in property and you get into this accessible you know, housing and you're passionate about it, but you're bumping up against some challenges. So what was that like then lifting the phone to your mentor and having those conversations? I think when, so I've, I've again, I've had multiple mentors. And so again, with the property training, you do invariably get a coach as well as part of your package. Um, so I've had situations where I've been under a coach and I've had situations where I've had a mentor and the way that they manage and kind of deal with your conversations are very different. Um, a lot of the time it is being guided to make your own conclusion because the mentors that I have worked with that I found have been really good at basically helping me come up with the solution, not telling me what to do, not telling mm. me, you know, right, okay, right, we need to do this, 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 and this. It's very much sort of, right, okay, let's get back into the granular stuff. Let's look at what could what went wrong, what could have been done better, you know, what is it that you want to achieve? Da, da, da. And so a good mentor, I think, will allow you to help you make your own conclusions because that's how you learn. You Nobody learns by being told what to do all the time. You've got to come to your own conclusion. So I would say from my experiences, they've been the better coach. And as much as I just want to go, someone tell me what to bloody do, like just give me the answers. Actually, in hindsight, looking back at it, actually it's been much better for me to just figure it out with guidance. You know, maybe they've gone, well, okay, have you maybe, maybe look at something maybe like this. But yeah, I would say that's probably been the most, the important thing but I think from a mindset point of view I've also been in a position where I haven't had anybody on side I've you know I currently I don't have a mentor um and you know with there are some issues with some projects where you kind of go I could just do with picking up the phone or sending an email or doing that and so I think having that support and just that security blanket as well it from a mindset point of view you can just feel confident that it will be okay one way or another. So I do feel that, you know, we I am in a position now where I'm kind of thinking as it's time to get another mentor for that reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's again quite interesting, the point of view of there's different people with different characteristics and there's some people who are um, have a leader mentality or a I'm doing this my way mentality and they're quite okay sitting in office on their own, looking at all the problems and trying to make decisions. But most people I've met in life like to have that person that they can bounce off the problem with and and want to hear other solutions before they make a decision uh, i think it's a minority of people are just i'm doing this no matter what because most people recognize in property nobody knows it all you know there's always circumstances out there that you'll come up against that even experienced property people have never had before and it's okay how do you you know how do you deal with that so um yeah that's that's certainly a very interesting point on that um i, I like the, the the analogy there about the, the teaching or just telling you what to do i, I liken it sometimes to and we have the designing the prop funders services which i'll probably mention before the end of the webinar but it's like one service is giving you the fish the other service is teaching you to fish um it's exactly what you say it's not just solving the problem it's trying to uh, mentor that exact that that exact sort of action of 
helping that person grow in their own experience in education, not just helping them solve the problem together, uh, which I think is very, very, you know, very, very important on that. Um, communication then, um, you know, pretty straightforward one. I mean, how often in the norm, um, maybe, well, we'll just go with you, Rich, just saying you're off camera or off uh, mute a minute. So how often would you um, communicate with your mentor? Is that a daily thing, a weekly thing? And then we'll go back to Angus on that. Again, it changes depending on, you know, who you're working with. Is, is it an educational kind of facilities that course or is it, you know, a private mentor? And, you know, for me, I found bi-weekly works really well. So just touching base every two weeks. Uh, so whether that's a half an hour Zoom um, or an hour or what have you, I found that there was enough happening in the space of two weeks for me to come back to the mentor or coach to go, right, okay, this has happened. It keeps you accountable as well. It keeps mm -hmm. you going. It keeps mm -hmm. momentum going. I think once a month is too long, I think you can get a bit lax. And then what happens is you're trying to squeeze everything into the two days before the mental, you know, the mental call. Um, so I think two weeks allows you to keep the momentum up. It allows you to hit the, you know, to deal with problems very quickly when they arise. Again, we all know, you know, a month is not very long, but in property, it can be a really long time and a lot can change in that time. So for me, every two weeks is the sweet spot. Mm, I'd never thought of that. Actually, that's a very good point. I, I like that sort of bi-weekly. So Angus, in terms of your your mentorship then, what what is there a norm or is it every different with different clients? I'm glad we said that because um, I completely agree with it because that's pretty much how I operate. Um, so I think, you know, I've done mentorships, again, for different organizations. So and some of that has been from on-site, three-day intensive, I come to you, I can assure you everything in practice, to programs which didn't really work where the kind of contact time was once every six weeks. What, you know, kind of my experience has kind of brought me back to kind of exactly what Ruth said. Two weeks feels right to me for exactly the reasons that Ruth said. What what I try to do, and look, I've got the flexibility to design my own program. So it, it depends on the individual because that's how I work. Um, you know, for me as well, what I, what I try to do is I try to, and I wanted to take off my life because I want to be an investor first and foremost, and you shouldn't be educated unless you're an invest, investor first and foremost, um, is I don't mind it turning into a kind of semi-ongoing dialogue because my, um, my mantra is um, we will speak every two weeks. I want you to be kind of making progress. And that's right for me for all the reasons we've said, but if something comes up, in those two weeks and that stops you in your tracks okay mm. um which doesn't happen too often um mm. then i want you to reach out with me and we will we will move past that we will find a find a way to move past that to enable you to keep moving forward so that as a as a mentee you are constantly feeling like you're able to make progress Mm, good point. Good point. Okay, so the last, um, the last sort of question then, or last point, and then we'll head towards wrap up. Um, how do you assess the success of a mentorship relationship? So again, it's quite good. We've kind of got a mentee and a mentor. So maybe we'll go with you, Angus Senior, again off mute. So how, how do you measure sort of success and value, or, or how should the the mentee? So I'll ask you from both perspectives and then we'll do the same with Ruth. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think it's really important at the outset to hit, um, to, to set um, objectives and, and, and smart objectives, you know, they're measurable. Um, you know, there is, there's an innate element of trust there within the mentor mentee relationship that my mm -hmm. job is to make sure that you understand what is required from you on a week by week or two bi weekly basis to achieve, you know, the, the results that we've agreed on by, um, by the end of the program. And there should be an end, you, you know, kind of my job should be to, to set you up with a model that you can roll out going forward. There should be a finite, you know, end to our relationship, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it is important. I think there is an element of trust there in terms of, you know, kind of, I will make clear what the kind of work you've got to put in. It's your job to deliver it. But ultimately, look, let's not kid ourselves, right? Regardless of what they say, the success or failure of how you perceive a mentor, it, you know, will be judged primarily by the deals that you do and the quality of those deals. And we can't get away from that. And in a way, look, yes, it's about growth, 
but it's it's right you know kind of if you are doing you know kind of what 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 we discuss and you are implementing and i'm able to help you and help you work through the challenges you know the results of it should be to do deals excellent okay and and ruth then how, how have you in the past say with the mentors you've worked with how you've how have you set out to measure success or value and and how you know at the end looking back has that has that been the best way of doing it Typically, I think uh, the red arrows of someone's just flying over. <laughs> so can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, again, everyone's been different. You start off with your why, you start off with the goal setting. Everyone does that. That's standard practice, right? Um, then I've had training where my co accountability coach is. You're under contract, right? So very simply, at each session, you set out your objectives for the next coming week or next two weeks, etc. And with one particular company, if you weren't consistently adhering to that and doing the work, you're off. Like, tough luck. You've paid the money. But if you're not committing to do the work, they're not going to spend their time and waste their time. Because what you're doing is you're actually wasting your mentor's time as well. So you've got to be really quite aware of that people are giving up time. You might be paying for it, but you don't want to waste their time either. So, but they are very strict on that. And you are under a written contracted agreement. So there are some companies which take it really, really seriously. Then there are others where I've had, and actually it just feels like all I've done is just have a good old bitch for an hour about, you know, this, that, and the other. And I've yeah. moaned about this not going right. And I've moaned about that. And actually there's not been any action steps there's not been anything set for the next week it's just like actually then it was just getting to the point where actually all I'm doing is just offloading and it was more a counseling session rather than actually somebody who was pushing me forward mm. so but it very simply comes down to you know if you've got a, anywhere from an average to a brilliant mentor they could be telling you all the right things to do. They will give you all the advice and the help that you need. But unless you are actually taking it seriously and committing to it and getting, the, you know, an understanding that your investment into that person is hopefully going to come back to you 20 fold. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many people who are course junkies yeah. do yeah. so many training courses, have so many mentors and are literally not progressing, not doing anything differently. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's very simply, it's on you. It's for you yeah. to do the work. Yeah. You've got to put the time and the effort in and the re results are going to be very much dependent on you and what you do. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a give and take from both sides. Um, but with regards to measuring success, absolutely. Where are the deals? Are you mm -hmm. doing deals? Are you making money? Um, you know, are you feeling more confident as well have you built your network do you have a presence do you have a brand you know there so as much as doing the deals there are all of these other aspects of you know do you have a business do you have business plans do you have structure modules etc in place as well mm -hmm. so you know again it comes down to what you're looking for but i think there are certain steps within that that actually if you can tick those boxes and say yes i am now recognized i have a brand i am the go-to on this sector right you know i think those are also really important to acknowledge as well yeah no some really really good good points there okay so i'll give um, both of you sort of one sentence summary wrap up um just while you're gathering your thoughts on that um yeah what you alluded to there um ruth is exactly where my bugbear has been over the years with a lot of people in the industry um and that is i remember hadn't been to a certain networking event for for many years um arrived back at it after eight or nine years um i was just talking to some people and bumped into this one guy and he's like yeah i was over in england and i did a rent to rent course and, and then i did an options course and then i did a brr course and then oh okay and how many properties have you got oh i haven't bought my first one yet and i'm like you gotta be kidding me the guy spent about nine and a half grand on all these specialist courses he hadn't even bought yeah. his first property. I know going, someone that, who's that, that yeah. can't be right. Like in my, in my mind, go that can't be right. You know, the people selling those courses to him in my mind are like are just taking advantage of him. Now, at the end of the day, it's a free market. If he wants to pay the money, and it's his route to education. Who am I to say that they shouldn't take his money? But I just look at it and go, that makes no sense to me. Yeah, I know someone who spent over sixty k on training and ha haven't even got a property yet, and it's just like. 
You're waiting yeah. for someone to do it for you. Those are yeah. the people that aren't taking action. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you aren't an action taker, don't get a mentor. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Okay, so if you can go first, sort of a, a one a one sentence wrap up on this topic of mentorship, the good, the bad, the ugly. Due diligence. That's literally all I can really focus on is, um, you know, I'm going through a process, as you well know, David, at the moment, trying to recover money from somebody who... I believed to be a good mentor. They, you know, said they came across well, they ticked all those sorts of boxes, but actually had I dug deeper into the company, into the company's house, into uh, the people who've gone through training with him, you know, I would probably not have wasted that money and have to now be going through, you know, an action fraud claim to get money back. I would say really spend time understanding who you're going to be working with right from the company house church, you know, are they up to date with their accounts? For example, you know, that's a very clear sign um, right through to get the phone number and the details of people who have had the mentorship with them and speak to them directly to find out if they are, you know, if they do what they do. So I would say absolutely, whoever you work with, do your due diligence. Don't just go with smoke and mirrors. Fantastic. And before I go to Yangus, uh, as Ruth was talking there, I saw you step back into FCA enforcement officer mode when you heard... Uh, Legal action, action, just action fraud, fraud yeah. cases, action fraud. Your 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 eyes just let up, Angus. Maybe you didn't realize it. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I didn't. Maybe I'm maybe I'm punching. No, but look, I look. Ruth is absolutely right. That is number one, right? Due diligence. I can't argue with that. She she got that absolutely nailed on. So so I guess I would have to follow with the number two, which is, um, make sure that you are as clear as you can be. You know what you were looking for to achieve out of the relationship mm -hmm. um and if you're struggling to work that out then you should be talking to someone who's willing to help you work that out and has the integrity to basically put their hands up and say you know kind of this isn't right for you i'm not right for you you shouldn't be paying me now you should be doing something different instead mm -hmm. so 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 just um you know, kind of not going into it as I want to get into property, put some thought into, well, you know, kind of what does that look like for me? Why, you know, how is it going to impact my life? Absolutely fantastic. So I think, I think what I've covered there is really beneficial for anyone who's sort of considering, you know, getting a mentor or um, wanting to know what's the best way of, of um, going into that space. Um, I, I think what we've covered there today has been very honest. So I really thank both of you for being so honest in terms of your own journeys and your own opinions on things. Uh, as I said, if someone wants to jump on uh, the blog link there, you can grab that and, and see some thoughts under each of those sections. But I certainly think that was was really, really beneficial. And I'll give I'll give both of you kind of one sentence at the end. We're going to finish literally in about a minute and a half. So you can think of just one more sort of literally one liner um, at the end. So um, just wrapping up then, for those that aren't familiar with Prop Funders, you can go to our Prop Funders um, welcome page. Um, you'll see a very short video introducing who we are, what we do. Um, there's a free download of the six steps to raising funds legally, um, which look at some of the key aspects. If you're a fundraiser, be that debt or equity, um, it's well worth understanding what those um, six steps are, particularly around the area of regulation and compliance. Uh, I think Angus, you're maybe due back on again next couple of months, and we'll we'll talk a lot about the reg regulatory space um, and, and and fundraising. But that's one maybe for September, October, November. Um, then for those that want to, uh, you can reach out and have a um, a call with me, book a call. I mean, get a chat if you feel there's something that we offer uh, that is of benefit to you. Uh, but really, we can help with all things fundraising. Um, that's really what we're about. For any developers who are looking to raise funds on the debt side, uh, we're partnered with Brickflow. So actually, you can go to our homepage. Uh, from there, there's a link, and you can actually put in the details of your project, and it will um, blot out the name of the lender, but it will give you all the lenders that are prepared to offer um, terms to you based on the information you submit. So a really good way of just filtering the market to see is your project viable, um, is there a lender that will engage with you on the on the, the details that you're offering? Um, and then obviously we can we can help with that if you decide to progress. And in terms of our actual services then, so we have what we call that um, fishing for you, um, the, the done for you preparation funding pack. That's helping a developer put together the information to then send to a lender or to a private equity investor 
Um, that is, is done effectively to FCA financial promotion standard because that's obviously what what our background, the prop funders team, we were regulated for five years. Um, we, we, we prepared about 30 um, documents that were then approved as a financial promotion. So we know that space very well. So we can help a developer do that. They might know how to do it, just might not have the time or maybe they don't have the skills to do it and we can bring that to the table for them. Um, others then like the ultimate funding pack that effectively is the mentorship pack um, where we go through the six steps to raising funds in detail, um, but then we can become a member of the team. So we can go to board meetings, we can go to team meetings, anything to do with funding, debt, equity, we can be there to help. And effectively that hand holding or in the pool with you right through your, your, your journey. Um, we're working with a number of people at that right now. Um, we enjoy that because we're actually in the trenches with the developer um, teaching them to fish effectively or helping them um, drag in the nets of fish, as the case may be. So uh, that, that's what we have. That's our services. Uh, and then we can take the developer and introduce them to funding partners. Some of those are regulated, um, some of them like bridging and unregulated space, but we can actually help the developer access the funding. So uh, talk about both Angus and Rafe talked about ultimately it's about success doing deals. Well, our, our value will be developers actually receiving their funding, not just teaching them how to do it, help them actually get the funding they need, debt or equity for their project. So that is us for today. We're actually going to take a break in August. Um, a lot of people are off in August, um, and uh, I think I need a break as well. So we're going to take a break in August, uh, back in September. Uh, and again, we'll have a, a topic, either a special guest or a panel uh, around something that's relevant uh, to raising funds legally. So um, Angus, Ruth, we'll go Angus first with you then, just a, a one sentence wrap up about the topic for today or property in general. The floor is yours. Oh, that's a big question. I think, um, well, based, based on what we said, I think, you know, kind of, I think there's been some really valuable advice there. And, you know, all I can kind of say is, um, I kind of repeat Ruth's point. I think she's right, due diligence. You know, if you take away one thing from that, Ruth's right, is that? Oh, can you tell my husband that? <laughs> <laughs> Ruth's right. I'm just going to get that on a sound clip. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Have that played in my house over and over again. Um, <laughs> right. For me, I think as well as the due diligence, part of the due diligence is also, and I now know this bit is absolutely key when you're finding a mentor to work with, find out the projects that have gone wrong. Find out how much money have they lost. You know, like really find out how much pain have they had to go through to be successful and carry on and go through the mindset and, you know, all of the downfalls. Because I find that, you know, there are so many people out there who've just started, as I said, you know, they're mainly a couple years in, they haven't learned the hard way and there's no way on earth that they have the knowledge, the resilience to understand what you're going through. So I would say having gone through painful, you know, experiences, you know, it's it's so key to have somebody also not one who understands how to maybe get out of it, but also to teach you that you will get through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they've Fantastic. got to understand that. So, yeah, I would say find out, you know, what how, what, how much pain have they been in? Absolutely fantastic. Listen, thanks everyone for joining today. I think that's been hugely valuable. It'll be on our socials in probably about an hour, an hour and a half, our YouTube channel for the recording. And uh, you can go through it again and write down any points you want. But massive thank you to Ruth. Massive thank you to Angus. Thanks for joining. Take care, everyone. Thanks Talk so to much. you all soon. And bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Bye.